Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a pleasure, uh, I must confess, um, a slightly nervous pleasure. I haven't delivered an inaugural lecture before. I was accused in politics of lecturing too often, but that was of a different variety. And I understand that this is the uh, first lecture to be delivered uh, in this new discipline, and I have had the distinct pleasure of meeting Professor Joseph Nye uh, on one of his uh, recent visits to Australia and uh, a couple of months ago of reading his latest book uh, called The Future of Power in which he analysed the various iterations of power wielded by countries uh, both now and likely to be so in the future. And in com Piling my thoughts for this lecture, I settle on trying to share with you a number of things. Firstly, the influences that I believe bring about and shape the broad foreign relations between countries. Secondly, those personalities and institutions within the Australian public policy and political system which determine individual foreign policy decisions. I also wanted to say something about a mechanism that I established as Prime Minister to deal with foreign policy and defence issues, namely the National Security Committee of Cabinet, uh, and also the particular role of a Prime Minister in executing and shaping foreign policy. And finally, I thought I would take you through as an exercise in what happened in a particular circumstance uh, the processes which led to the most controversial foreign policy decision that my government took and that was our decision to commit military forces to the operation in Iraq in March of 2003. When I reflected on those things that shaped foreign relations between countries, and this applies to Australia as much as it applies to any other nation, but my experience is naturally informed by the Australian experience. I thought of quite a number and I, I list them not necessarily in order of importance, but recognising immediately that um, they overlap and interlock in many areas. Every nation's foreign relations, every nation's attitudes towards other countries are informed by the history of that country, by its values and its culture. It's impossible and this applied all the more so decades ago than it does today for Australia to reflect on the world without being influenced by the history of this country as part of Western civilization, of the stances that it took in the two great world conflicts of the 20th century and its identification with the values of liberal democracy not only in our part of the world but around the world. It's impossible for Australia to um, deport itself in the world without identifying to some degree with those values in the decisions that we take. The challenge of diplomacy, the challenge of decision making by governments of course is to balance our view of what we would like the world to be with our view of what it is possible for the world to be. It's also important to recognise that in shaping attitudes to other countries, every nation is governed by conditions of self-interest. Australia is no exception. You're all aware of the famous dictum, was it, of Palmerston that nations do not have permanent friends, they only have permanent interests. Well, the most permanent interest of all is self-interest. Right at the moment, there's something of a public policy debate about the attitude Australia should take uh, 
towards the relationship between China and the United States in our part of the world. Now, if I apply the principle of self-interest, which I tried to do when I was Prime Minister, and I believe should continue to be applied, it is overwhelmingly in Australia's self-interest to maintain and further develop close relations with both of those countries and to do all in our power to ensure that there is no unnecessary conflict between the United States and China. The United States, of course, is our most important and strongest national security partner. The values of Australia and the values of the United States more closely resemble each other than the values of our country with many other countries. So overwhelmingly it is in our interest to maintain a self-interested as well as values-based relationship with the United States. It is also of course in our interest to maintain the strong economic relationship that Australia has built with China, especially over the last decade. I think it is beyond political debate in Australia at the present time that one of the major reasons that Australia avoided the adverse effects of the global financial crisis, as it's been called, was the fact that we have a very healthy trade with China. Another factor that bears upon the determination of our foreign relations is geography. Our nearest neighbour, we frequently say, is Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, for that reason alone, it's a very important political entity, not only in our part of the world, but indeed around the world. Yet our economic relationship with Indonesia is not extensive. It's probable that our economic relationship with Indonesia ranks about eight or nine on the scale of countries in our region. Yet it is overwhelmingly in Australia's interest to have good relations with Indonesia because Indonesia is so very close to us. And whatever values we might bring to the relationship self-interest compounds geography to require us to have a close relationship with Indonesia. And successive Prime Ministers, each in their different ways, have endeavoured to uh, bring about warm relations between our two countries. And the desire to maintain close relations with Jakarta was one of the dominant streams in a bipartisan approach to the issue of East Timor, uh, which was not broken until the events uh, of uh, 1999, which I will come to in a moment. Another issue that clearly influences relations with other nations, whether it's Australia or indeed other countries, is economic strength. The stronger you are economically, the more notice people take of you. There is no doubt about that. That's been the experience of China. It was the experience of the United States. It the experience, it's the experience of Greece and the other members of the Euro, given the relative economic strength uh, of Germany. In the late 1990s, the nations of our region suffered what was called the Asian economic downturn, which had a devastating effect on the economies of Korea, of Thailand, of Indonesia and of Malaysia. Fortunately, Australia avoided the adverse effects of that economic downturn. Not only did we avoid them, but we were able to provide direct economic assistance to Indonesia, Korea and Thailand. And indeed, apart from Japan, Australia was the only country in the world that provided that direct economic help. And out of that series of events, Australia was seen in the region as being a stronger economic player than had hitherto been thought. And as a consequence of that, our influence in the region in other areas grew very strongly. And the fact that we argued at the time against the severity of the conditions imposed on Indonesia by the International Monetary Fund, uh, 
as a condition of the fund providing adjustment assistance to Indonesia. Uh, won us additional respect and understanding and support in the region. And Australia was seen for the first time in the eyes of some in the region as being predominantly a regional player in her own right, rather than simply expressing the views of the International Monetary Fund or expressing the views of the United States uh, or some of the European countries. Of course, economic strength having an influence on, in, on uh, external relations of foreign affairs is not confined to Australia. Right at the moment, I am observing, and perhaps many of you are, uh, a quite fascinating development in relation to the dependence of the United States on Middle East oil. I can testify to the fact that dependence on Middle East oil has been the nightmare of successive United States presidents. The two that I dealt with expressed concern about it in almost identical language. But now what we are seeing through the extraordinary developments in the process of extracting shale, I'm sorry, gas and oil from shale, we are seeing what could be a real game changer in the energy relationship between the United States and the Middle East. Because if the United States, through her superior technology, uh, can really unlock the potential of this alternative energy source, and bear in mind that the greenhouse gas impact of gas is about half as is from black coal, and bear in mind that if the United States can reduce this tremendous dependency it has on importing Middle East oil, it will have a hugely transforming effect on the economic relations between the United States and the Middle East, with all the consequences that has for uh, uh, apparent um, uh, American attitudes towards uh, Saudi Arabia, towards Iran, uh, the, the constant difficulties involved in the relationship between Israel and, and other countries in, in the Middle East. It, its potential is enormous. And it's a, an illustration away from Australia, although it will have implications for us, but it's a, a reminder of the potency uh, of, uh, of economic change and economic strength. Of course, the, the different philosophies of governments can influence our relations with the rest of the world. I come to this lecture seeking to be as bipartisan as I can and I should be. And I think it's fair to say that it's in no way partisan to observe that one of the differences between coalition governments and Labor governments in the field of foreign affairs over the years has been that the Labor Party in government has given warmer support, I could put it that way, or has had a greater commitment to multilateral institutions. It's not that the coalition has been indifferent to multilateral institutions, but perhaps we haven't been as starry-eyed about their potency in particular sets of circumstances. And there's a longer tradition in the Labor Party, partly due to the fact that in Labor Party history, Dr. Evatt, who was the foreign minister at the time, played a significant role in the formation of the United Nations and was in fact, I think, the first or second uh, president of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And he, of course, as many of you know, uh, went on to become uh, leader of the Labor Party uh, in the 1950s. Uh, an illustration, of course, is the very high priority that both the Rudd and Gillard governments have given to winning um, a non-permanent seat on the Security Council. And in the, consequences, in the consequence of pursuing that, of course, has been, in my view and in the view of many, some modification, some modification of government policy uh, in relation to the Middle East and also in relation to some attitude struck uh, in Africa. And the final shaper, if I can put it that way, of external relations is what 
is generally called and what is the, the title of this new discipline and that is soft power. And in all sorts of different ways, uh, soft power plays an enormous role in shaping attitudes. I think it's fair to say that one of the greatest things historically that Australia did after World War II uh, to enhance her status in our region uh, was to um, introduce what was known as the Colombo Plan. And at that particular time, uh, we extended university education to people in our region at a time when the availability of university education in many countries of our region was at a very low level. And uh, I had personal experience many years later when I became Prime Minister of the value of generations of men and women who'd been educated in Australia through the Colombo Plan, the value of that in holding together a relationship with Malaysia, which at a head of government level uh, had deteriorated very badly. Paul Keating and I were often on the opposite sides of an argument, but we weren't when it came to Dr Mahathir, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, uh, who didn't get on with my predecessor and in the end he didn't get on with me either. He didn't seem to like Australian Prime Ministers uh, of either political stripe, he didn't seem to like the attitudes of our country and he didn't seem to like on occasions anybody very much but um, be that as it may um, one of the things that did hold our relationship together uh, was the fact that of all the nations in the world the largest proportion of alumni of Australian universities to be found anywhere is to be found in Malaysia and although at a head of government level the relationship deteriorated further down the relationship was held together very, very effectively. And one of the reasons for that was the great legacy of the Colombo Plan. And I, I, I still draw on it as one of the great examples of soft power and I know how important um, overseas students are to universities in Australia. And it's a source of pride to me and I think it should be to uh, all of us in Australia that uh, in Australia is seen as an extremely attractive destination for university students and the invaluable deposit of goodwill for the future uh, that that uh, creates is, is tremendous and I think that's a, a wonderful example of, of soft power. Now they are some of the general influences. That's not an exhaustive list uh, and uh, it's certainly not a definitive list but it's a, a list that I've compiled based on my own experience and I hope some common sense observations. Now that's a general framework but when it actually comes to individual decision making, who really influences and what are the agencies that really influence things? Well obviously one should start at the very beginning and that is that the political decisions of an elected government do shape foreign policy and there are changes made when governments change. In some cases they change very abruptly on a particular issue. Way back in 1972 uh, when Gough Whitman was elected, his decision uh, to extend recognition to communist China, as it was then called, uh, to Beijing uh, was um, uh, a game changer of a decision. Uh, and um, uh, it, it certainly was a very different approach from uh, the decisions that had been taken by previous coalition governments which had followed uh, the, uh, or had adopted the same policy as the United States of not extending recognition to communist China only of course to find themselves rather undercut when President Nixon the then President Nixon made his famous uh, visit to China in the middle of 1972. Well, that was a game changer of a decision. Uh, it's also fair to say, uh, in that, staying in that decade, uh, that um, the Whitlam Labor government took a very different attitude when it assumed office in relation to the, uh, the recognition of, um, uh, or the, 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 the international position of what was called then the Baltic States, namely um, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, uh, which were constituent parts of the Soviet Union, 
and which had been the subject of the infamous secret protocols uh, of the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact uh, just before the outbreak of World War II. The attitude they took, or well, the Whitlam government took to that was very different from the attitude that was taken by the Fraser government when it was elected in 1975 when that de facto recognition of the incorporation of those three Baltic states into the Soviet Union uh, was revoked. Now sometimes when governments change there aren't immediate dramatic decisions made uh, that are totally different from the previous positions taken. Uh, East Timor, which I mentioned earlier, uh, had effectively been incorporated uh, into Indonesia um, without too many objections from either side of politics in Australia. I think it's fair and even-handed to say that in 1975. And when the Fraser government was elected, there was some change uh, not a lot, but some, and then the same policy of, of really paying more regard to good relations with Jakarta than displaying too much sensitivity towards the position of East Timor was really followed quite substantially until the change occurred under my government in 1998, partly because of the different attitude taken by the Indonesian president, Dr Habibi, who succeeded uh, President Suharto uh, and partly because of a growing feeling within the Australian community from both the right and the left uh, that the time had come uh, for us to revisit our attitude towards the position of the East Timorese. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, just as the Department of State in the United States or the British Foreign Office uh, because of its enormous institutional memory and influence is a significant player in the shaping of the foreign policy of Australia. Uh, we have high quality diplomats and we have a high quality department. I didn't always agree with its advice on, on a number of conspicuous issues. I disagreed very strongly but I always respected its professionalism and uh, the quality of the people it produced. And an important and unimportant diplomatic issues, the quality of representation in another country can be hugely significant. Australia has been very well served over the last 20 or so years by the ambassadors we've had in China, uh, in Jakarta, uh, and in Tokyo. Now I mention those three not to suggest we haven't been very well served by others but uh, they are located in or have been located in three capitals that have been very important to Australia. We also were exceptionally well served by our senior diplomatic representatives in Washington and London, uh, Michael Thorley and Michael Lestrange uh, at a time when because of our involvement alongside the United States and Britain in Afghanistan, in Iraq, the intensity of political exchange and intelligence exchange between our three countries uh, was, uh, was very great indeed. It's also the case that on important occasions individuals outside the mainstream of the diplomatic process can play a significant role in negotiating a foreign affairs outcome. It's widely believed that the negotiation of the security treaty between Australia and Indonesia in the dying days of the Keating government was in no uh, small part facilitated by the work of the retired Chief of the Defence Force, uh, uh, General Gration, who had very strong links with the Indonesian political system and the Indonesian military. It's also the case that the very strong personal links between the Australian Federal Police Commissioner Mick Kilty uh, and his Indonesian counterpart facilitated the tremendously productive cooperation between the Indonesian police and the Australian Federal Police after the terrible Bali attack uh, of October in 2002 and that arose out of the fact that both of them had attended 
the same military training course in the 1980s uh, in Australia. Academia, academia and think tanks are playing an increasing role in shaping the political debate. I don't agree with a great deal of what Hugh White has said uh, in his recent book uh, about the China choice, but there's no doubt, uh, to quote a contemporary example, and he is uh, the head of School of International Study at the Australian National University, there's no doubt that that book is playing a prominent role in the debate that's going on at the present time. The personal roles of foreign ministers can also play a very big part in shaping foreign policy. That will depend on how good they are, how long they stay there, and whether their prime minister supports what they're trying to do. Uh, we had in rapid succession, they followed each other, two men from different sides of politics who were long-standing foreign ministers. Gareth Evans was foreign minister firstly in the Hawke government and then in the Keating government between 1989 and uh, 1996, something like seven and a half years. And then Alexander Downer became the foreign minister and he became Australia's longest serving foreign minister and served in that position throughout the entirety of the government that I led. So for a period of some 18 years, we had two men, both of whom had a very strong personal influence. Not in the sense of shaping in isolation what the government does, because foreign policy doesn't really work like that. No foreign minister can get away with uh, shaping a foreign policy in uh, diametrically opposed to the attitudes of the other senior members of the government. But a strong, effective, intelligent foreign minister can leave a mark of his or her own which uh, rebounds to the credit. Gareth Evans uh, played a major role in the Cambodian peace settlement. I think it's fair to say that it was one of the real achievements uh, of Australian foreign policy during that time and he deserves credit for it. Alexander Downer played a, uh, a, you know, an indefatigable role in building the personal links uh, <clears throat> that are important between the foreign ministers of Australia and the foreign ministers of our major friends and allies not only in our region but around the world. He was also passionately committed to one or two issues that caused debate within our own ranks. One of them was Australia's membership of the International Criminal Court, which uh, was the subject of quite a lively debate in our party room. Uh, Alexander Downer was a very strong advocate of our participation in that, subject to proper safeguards in relation to adjudication of issues involving our own military forces, and uh, in the end the view that he advocated prevailed. I quote those two examples, but there are many others. But it is important if you have a continuity in the personnel of the occupant of the foreign office, the foreign ministry, uh, that can be very beneficial. The role of the prime minister, of course, is also very important. Not only as the head of the government and therefore the chairman of cabinet, but also through the development of strong personal relations with other leaders. I am remembered, I guess, for having developed a personal relationship with both George Bush and Tony Blair, and uh, that is certainly true. And we spent a great deal of time uh, talking and acting together on certain issues. I also reflect on the importance of the relationship that I developed with the former president of China, President Jiang Zemin. Um, when I became prime minister, I saw in the first few months that we were in office a deterioration in the relationship between Australia and China. Everything seemed to go wrong. We argued over the Taiwan Straits. We argued over ministerial visits to Taiwan. Uh, we argued over the implications for China of the abolition of a of an economic assistance program which we decided to abolish because we could no longer afford it, particularly with a large budget deficit to, uh, to be dealt with. And uh, within six months, our relationship had really deteriorated. And 
a meeting that I had with the Chinese president in Manila late in 1996, followed by an invitation to visit China in, at Easter of 1997, uh, laid the groundwork for a, a personal relationship uh, which I believe contributed significantly to uh, the improvement in relations between our two countries uh, over the ensuing uh, 10 years. And I was very proud of the fact that his successor, uh, uh, Hu Jintao, who will retire as Chinese president in a few months, uh, chose to visit Australia not long after becoming president as part of his first major overseas visit as Chinese president. And many of you will recall that President Hu Jintao addressed a joint sitting of the Australian Parliament in October of 2003, uh, a day after President Bush uh, had fulfilled uh, the same responsibility. And it's also important in the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. The relationship between Australia and Indonesia is very difficult, always. We are vastly different countries, our culture is different, uh, our um, religious influences and the shaping of our societies are different, our populations are different, our economic progress is different, and until the last uh, decade, our systems of government have been very different. Although Indonesia is now the third largest functioning democracy in the world, and in my opinion doesn't get enough credit from most of the rest of the world for that achievement. And the man who's made an enormous contribution to that is the current Indonesian president. I first got to know him at at the first anniversary of the Bali attack when he represented his president at the memorial service. And he gave a very inspiring speech which matched his compassion for and his desire for cooperation between nations but, and also uh, his uh, detestation of terrorism. It was a wonderful rallying call to moderate Islam to understand that its future lie in abhorring and not in any way sympathising with terrorism. Uh, subsequently to that, when he was elected president, I went to his inauguration and then in the wake of the terrible tsunami uh, in, on Boxing Day in 2004, uh, I decided that Australia should give an unprecedentedly large amount uh, of direct assistance to Indonesia. It was in fact both proportionately and numerically the largest amount of aid given by any country uh, to Indonesia uh, in the wake uh, of that tsunami. And those things did much to uh, improve, indeed cement the relationship between two countries. And there was a strong personal chemistry, if I can put it that way, between President Uniono and myself. And I think it did uh, play a valuable role. And finally, and we should never forget this because we live in a democracy, the other thing that shapes uh, attitudes on particular issues is, believe it or not, public opinion. Uh, people who and self-proclaimed experts and diplomatic dietitians who run around saying the last thing you should ever do is take notice of what the public thinks uh, are not only supremely elitist, uh, but they're also wrong, because uh, in a democracy you do take notice of what the public says. Uh, I don't want to dwell for any longer than just a brief reference on the issue of asylum seeker policy, but we have seen an acknowledgement that public opinion does matter, and uh, I have no doubt that public opinion more than anything else has shaped the recent decisions of the government. Can I just say that one of the most important things my government did to properly coordinate and run uh, foreign affairs and defence was to establish the National Security Committee of Cabinet. This was far and away the best cabinet committee or, uh, that we had. I'm not saying the others weren't good. Uh, and what made this the best was that all the time cabinet colleagues who weren't on it wanted to get on it. And uh, that's always a sign when people want more work like that. It's always a good sign. But this was a committee chaired by the Prime Minister, comprised as well as uh, the Prime Minister, of course included the Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the National Party, 
uh, the treasurer, Peter Costello, and he was treasurer during the whole time of our government, Alexander Downer, the foreign minister, uh, the defence minister and the attorney general. And as well as those ministers, and it was just a core of the ministers that mattered on foreign affairs and security issues, we also had their um, civil service and defence counterparts. We had the Secretary of My Department, the Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Secretary of Defence, the Chief of the Defence Force, the Director General of ASIO, uh, the, and also the Director General of the Office of National Assessments, and that's the body that distills the various pieces of intelligence that come to the government. And what was great about this body was that it functioned often on a day-to-day -day meeting basis during all of the major foreign affairs and security crises or challenges that Australia had. Uh, it never leaked. Uh, there was always, apart from one or two rare occasions when a nakedly political decision uh, had to be discussed, it, it always involved, had the full participation of the non-political figures as well as the political ones and that gave it a, a real quality and a real value. And one of the things I learnt about politics in different countries was that for all that I admire many things about the American uh, nation and the political system, I don't think its political system is superior to ours. And one of the great problems of American decision making is that they do not have coherence across the whole of government. Uh, John Maynard Keynes famously said when he first started travelling to Washington in the early 1940s, there were two things that struck him about government in America. The first was that the lawyers were everywhere and uh, he said you'd make a decision and then you'd hand it over to the lawyers to tidy it up and he said you'd then find out you didn't have a decision. Now I think probably he was being a bit unfair to the lawyers but the second thing is that government in America operated in silos. That You had the State Department, you had the Treasury, you had the Pentagon etc. And the, that's a long time ago, the early 1940s, but there is still an element of truth. And one of the great advantages of the National Security Committee system was that everybody knew, everybody that mattered knew what the government's position was. And after a decision had been taken and uh, uh, declared at our meetings and circulated, there could be no argument. And if some agency or some individual tried to dart off to the side, uh, there was always a capacity to bring them back. Now I'm not suggesting they did, but it did work uh, extremely well. Now I mentioned finally that I would just illustrate through a brief narrative of the Iraqi decision how that particular uh, decision was taken and some of the uh, issues that led up to it. Uh, as um, the uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor said, I was in Washington on the 11th of September and um, that did influence uh, my attitude towards uh, Australia's response in relation to Afghanistan. I, I still believe that Australia would have uh, contributed as we did, whether I'd been there or not, but uh, I did understand the depth of feeling, the, f the shock and disbelief and anger on the part of the American people and the concern that many of them had uh, about one thing and one thing alone, when and where was the next attack uh, on the United States going to occur? We, it now, what, 11 years on, it's easy to say, well, you know, there was only one attack and that's it. That was not the view of the people in the United States at that particular time, and they uh, entertained a very genuine fear uh, that an attack was going to occur. Um, this has no doubt been debated before, but just for the record, let me say, I didn't believe that Saddam Hussein uh, played any role in the attack on the 11th of September 2001. Of course he didn't. And neither, might I say, did the former President of the United States, uh, nor most of the sensible people around him. Uh, it was pretty quickly uh, identified that the source of that attack had been, was Al-Qaeda, and orchestrated out of Afghanistan and that was a view expressed to me the day after the attack by Richard Armitage, the Deputy um, Secretary of State and a figure who many of you are familiar with who's played a major role uh, in relations between Australia and the United States.
We agreed within a couple of months of, um, and I'm sorry, in the early part of uh, 2002, uh, that although we had made no commitment, if there were to be an American military operation against Iraq, we had made no commitment to join it. We were nonetheless in the context of our very close defence cooperation, stationed some military personnel in Tampa in Florida, uh, the headquarters of the US Central Command, uh, so that preliminary planning could take place in the event that we were to join that operation. We had of course been involved militarily with the United States uh, in Afghanistan and the links between the top level of their military and ours were very extensive. I maintained uh, regular contact with President Bush and the British Prime Minister Tony Blair over intelligence and diplomatic issues as 2002 proceeded and there continued to be between the defence ministers of our three countries as well as our foreign minister, the British Foreign Secretary, then Jack Straw uh, and uh, Colin Powell of the United States uh, contact with Alexander Downer and our military chiefs also maintained very close relationships. There were through 2002 continued diplomatic efforts through the United Nations to secure further United Nations resolutions in relation to Iraq's non-compliance uh, with earlier uh, resolutions of the UN. And importantly, there were continued intelligence briefings and uh, I had a number of those including direct intelligence briefings from the then head of the CIA and also Sir Richard Dearlove, the then head of MI6 uh, in the United Kingdom. One of the important visits that I played in the lead up to our decision was uh, on the way back from a visit to the United States and the United Kingdom. I asked to see President Megawati of Indonesia. I knew that if Australia were to join the Americans and others that the Indonesians would display considerable sensitivity uh, given uh, that uh, Iraq was an Islamic country and given the stance that Indonesia had historically taken in relation to affairs in the Middle East, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Palestinians. Although it's fair to say that uh, Indonesia has had a rather more cooperative attitude towards Israel than a number of other countries uh, uh, in the region. Uh, I wanted to visit President Megawati to make the point that any Australian involvement should not be seen as anti-Islamic, certainly should be understood in the context uh, of a number of things including our close relationship with the United States and I believe that that, that um, uh, visit uh, played a role in uh, uh, reducing what might otherwise have been a more hostile and unsympathetic reaction from Indonesia because it was understood by the President as a particular gesture uh, on my part, Australia's part, towards the relationship. And, and finally can I mention, and I, I, I cite these things uh, not to argue one thing or another but simply to indicate in a, in a, in a, in a personal way the dynamic and uh, some of the dynamics uh, of a decision making process and one of the last things that I did before the final decision was taken after the ultimatum delivered by the Americans ran out and we decided to commit our forces uh, was to telephone three heads of government uh, whose countries were represented on the Security Council in the hope of persuading them uh, to support the additional re resolution that had been tabled by the United States and the United Kingdom. And I, I telephoned uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland, uh, Bertie Ahern, who I knew very well and who was a charming character who uh, urbanely listened to everything I had to say and with equal urbanity assured me that he would take it uh, into account. Um, I telephoned President Musharraf of Pakistan uh, not in any belief that he was going to support the resolution but uh, I knew him very well 
Uh, we spent the first 10 minutes of our conversation discussing his greatest passion, cricket, and uh, uh, after we uh, had done that, uh, we then uh, discussed the purpose of the phone call and uh, he listened politely, but I did not believe for a moment that he was going to instruct his representative uh, to cast a vote in our favour, in favour of the resolution. And finally, I telephoned President Vincente Fox of Mexico, who uh, I found uh, somewhat to my surprise to be extremely hostile uh, to um, uh, the very thought of supporting uh, the um, uh, proposed resolution. It was an interesting experience, and I mention it um, to uh, perhaps uh, underscore the personal character of many of the things that a head of government as well as a foreign minister must be involved in. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's perhaps been uh, an overlong uh, analysis of some of my reflections uh, on uh, what shapes our foreign relations. Um, Perhaps I could, I could finish on saying that um, Palmerson was largely correct, but not totally correct. Um, I think there are permanent friends uh, in international affairs. I think we have permanent friends. Um, they vary, they wax and wane, and along the way we acquire new friends. Uh, and. Uh, the object of good foreign policy and the object of good diplomacy should be to add to your good friends uh, as time goes by, but also to keep in mind the abiding self-interest that your country has in preventing arguments between the friends that you have. Because if your friends argue, uh, while you may not be trampled in the process, depending on how big those friends are, uh, it may have some very adverse security uh, and other impacts. Uh, I wish the course well. I appreciate the opportunity that the university has given me to deliver this lecture and I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have for me. Thank you.